Hi guys, welcome back to Blurred Box. I'm Chloe. I'm Sophie. And I'm Andrew. And today we're bringing you a new special guest, as we promised from our introduction to season two. We have Shivek Narang, the founder of Our Teen Brains. Hello. So Shivek, you want to tell us a bit about yourself? Yeah, so I'm a senior here at Stanford Online High School. It's my second year full time. I live in the Bay Area, California, um, in Fremont. I've been really, really interested in neuroscience and the adolescent brain um, for like the last few years, for the last four or five years. And I've been really interested in studying how, I guess, our community and the way like we're developing impacts the way our brain develops and leads to a lot of like the behaviors um, and different actions that we do see from teenagers um, during their adolescent years. That's so cool, actually. Um, I just had a really quick question, like, what particularly sparked that interest in like your research in the adolescent brain and our team brains? So what was that kind of catalyst? Yeah, definitely. So I guess when I was in eighth grade, um, I used to love biology. Like I really love biology. It's my, one of my favorite subjects. And so I was talking to my biology teacher and she recommended that I join my school's neuroscience club. Um, and so it was actually there. I did a brain dissection for the first time. I saw a sheep brain. Um, and from there, I just got hooked onto neuroscience. So it was a field in biology that I started just love and love, and my neuroscience passion grew from there. Now, incidentally, when I was actually in seventh grade, I actually participated in a debate. Um, and so it was a Lincoln Douglas debate, and they typically have like a certain prompt, like every two month period. And the prompt, first prompt I participated in was, do adolescents ought to have the right to have medical autonomy? And so obviously, when you're preparing a debate, you have to do a bit of research um, to prepare your case. And then I learned about, like, about the developing brain. So I learned teenager brains aren't really stable. There's like the prefrontal cortex, which is constantly changing, which is like the, I guess the most famous part of the adolescent brain. But there's many other regions of the brain which are developing, causing like imbalance. And because they're constantly changing, you can think it's like not really stable in a way, right? So, um, and I was using that to make my argument for the debate. And so again, back to eighth grade, when I was joining my school's neuroscience club, I began reading a bit more into um, into the neuroscience field. I read about like Alzheimer's disease and all these neuro neurodegenerative disorders. But I also learned about like how our brains develop from when we're born, how like from just a little tube, it becomes a full on brain, right? And when I was reading into that, um, specifically about the teenage brain, once again, it was talking about the development that happens. And it's like a critical period in development, actually, they call adolescence. And again, I began to read a bit more about how the, how behavior is changing. And so um, I would tell my mom about this, like, for example, oh, this is the brain is changing, that's how we tend to be impulsive. And then I would sometimes make a really impulsive statement at home, something that when I work at my mom, like, oh, that's the teenage brain right there. And <laughs> frankly, she wasn't wrong, right? That's how it is. And so um, because of that, I got a bit more interested in the teenage brain because I was like 14 years old at the time. I was a teenager myself. And I started understanding that some of the behaviors I'm undergoing and I'm exhibiting were like behaviors that match the description of what normally happens during adolescence. And so when I began to like uh, understand this a bit more, I felt this really empowering because the thing is not a lot of teenagers understand that like the brains are developing at this time, right? And when we don't really understand something that goes on, it's hard to have a bit of a control over situations, which is why a lot of teenagers tend to be more reckless. They get in accidents. Um, even there's a lot of substance abuse during this time as well. And so I feel like understanding the adolescent brain is really empowering. And because I was able to understand that, I told a few of my friends, I thought I should expand this to share this information with like as many teenagers as I possibly could. That's awesome. It's really great to hear how passionate you are in, in this field and what you're trying to do. And one of the words that definitely are the most, I guess, sticking out in your website as well, you can tell us a bit about, I guess, what our teen brains is and also how you empower teenagers through what you're trying to achieve? Yeah, so Our Teen Brains is a nonprofit organization where we basically give presentations on the various aspects of the teenage brain to our community. And so I guess when we're talking about the teenage brain, there's more than one aspect, right? We have the anatomy aspect, which is really big in understanding what actually is going on. But there's very there's like many different behaviors and um, I guess symptoms to analyze as well, like impulsivity, because teen why are teenagers so impulsive? loneliness and friendship because friendship is a really really big part of adolescence of, of brain development because the way you interact with others your close friends they have a huge impact on, on your life in the future Peer, but that also is the peer pressure right that's also something to keep in mind and something to be aware of um but then there's also like 
COVID, now with COVID-19, that there's also the impacts of that on the brain, how that contributes to loneliness. And so there's many different aspects of the brain to take um, into consideration. And so what I do is that I do make these presentations on these various different impacts of the teenage brain. And I, I, give, I give these presentations. So actually, um, I live in the Bay Area, as I mentioned. And so I would go to Bay Area schools, libraries, other youth forums, um, and give these presentations to high schoolers. Um, and the thing is, when I understood more about my teenage brain, I would, I would, I guess, second guess myself. Like before, there was an impulsive statement like on the tip of my lips. Before I would just say that like sentence without thinking, I try to stop myself. And I'll admit, I'm not perfect. It still happens to me quite a bit that I do say these impulsive statements. But I think the thing is that I've been able to uh, like think what I'm saying, right? Just not blurt things out all the time. That's been really helpful for me. Um, I've also been able to reject, like for example, when friends try to peer pressure me to drugs or alcohol a couple of times, I've been able to reject that because I'm thinking that's not the way, that's not the way we should go, right? Because that's not going to benefit me at all. And so understanding this has been really empowering, I feel, for me. Um, and sharing this with my community, with other teenagers, I feel like they would also be able to be similarly empowered um, and be able to make sure that they're, they're thinking before they perform an action, which is something that unfortunately during the teenagers doesn't really happen a lot, like in critical situations because we think with our emotions um, instead of our mind, basically. Um, but in addition to giving these presentations, like I guess one really big presentation I gave was at a, at a summit um, for over a thousand people. And after that presentation, a lot of parents would actually come up to me because I gave it an audience of teenagers and their parents. And they said this information is really, really helpful for them in understanding their teenager. Um, and they wanted me to, I guess, take this online as well because not all of them were from the Bay Area in that presentation. And so they wanted me to take it online so they could access this from um, other sites as well. And I guess that led to my website, also a little bit of a YouTube channel where I share these presentations. Um, also a similar podcast where, again, they're able to hear about these aspects of the teenage brain. And I've had people reach out from all over the world recently. Australia, UK, and Egypt um, come to my mind. And they've wanted me to give presentations there as well to share, I guess, a bit about the teenage brain with their communities as well. Um, because it is so empowering, I guess, to understand what is happening um, inside your brain, what is really, because the brain controls everything we do, right? And so to understand that is definitely a really empowering tool for teenagers. That's what I, that's what I guess I've been doing um, in terms of giving presentations to help teenagers, starting in my Bay Area, but then expanding throughout the nation and then even international. That's amazing. I'm like a yeah. huge advocate for like, awareness is the first step to change. So I'm really impressed with what you're doing. And um, I was just wondering, so like you said, mental health is just, it's just not an issue that's talked about. And I'm really glad that you're spreading more awareness about that. But what do you think is like the next steps after that? Like, what do you think uh, parents should be implementing to help with kids that have mental health or anything else? Like, what do you think are the next steps? So when I mentioned that like teenagers aren't like aware of the adolescent brain, I should also mention that even parents actually aren't really aware of the changes that goes on. And that's why oftentimes like you'll hear people say, oh, teenagers are so reckless. Teenagers do this, teenagers do that. And it's almost like they're blaming teenagers. And that's not to say I'm shifting the blame off of adolescents. But I guess what I'm trying to say is that um, it also, like it isn't something that teenagers can fully control because um, of controlling the develop control, it's, well, it's the, it's the brain is constantly changing, um, it's molding, it's developing, and teenagers aren't aware of that. And so it's not that they're trying to be impulsive. It's not like teenagers were trying to make a, like, a really bad decision. It's just something that does happen um, as a product of development. And that is um, something that parents and caretakers sometimes don't understand as well. And so I guess while giving these presentations, we also talk to these parents and caregivers so they can also um, get an understanding of what's going on. Um, also, actually, I've been reaching out to similar organizations, um, and this isn't really about parents, but for example, there's an organization in the Bay Area um, which deals with teenagers and eating disorders. And so I've been working with her to like kind of talk about um, the anatomy behind what's happening because eating disorders affect quite a, it's, it's not infrequent, I guess, what I'm trying to say is among teenagers. And so I've been working with her as well to share um, some of my insights of what I've understood, and she's teaching me about what happened when these um, individuals come to her inpatient side with like, for example, a patient lost 40 pounds in like less than two months. And so definitely, yes, eating disorders, anorexia, really deadly conditions as well. Um, another person, uh, 
I was talking recently, he has another foundation in the Bay Area. Um, he works in like teenagers for mental health um, disorders um, in, I guess, like an intensive outpatient care, which means like patients who aren't like at a life risk immediately, but who still need to check in just to make sure that they're coming back to normal. And again, we've been discussing um, some of the issues that happen during adolescence and how that, I guess, does lead to mental health pressures for teenagers. And I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with the Bay Area, but in the Bay Area, I guess there's an inherent sense of competition laid in everywhere. And that makes it some of the, one of the most stressful areas in the nation. Like, in fact, I think there's Gunn High School was famous for its like suicide clusters. Um, like, I think a couple of years ago, actually, like 2016. Um, and there was actually a documentary filmed at Gunn High School. And I forget the name off the top of my head, but that was kind of talking about all the um, stress and pressure that happens on these adolescents because it's just an area that's like filled with competition and desire to be better than everyone else. And I guess that mentality does like using the teenagers and makes everyone want to do more to be above, um, to go above and beyond. And that also is definitely leading to quite a bit of struggle in the Bay Area. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I just want to chime in for a second and say, first of all, I have so much respect for you, like bio, enough of a struggle, like getting into neuroscience, pretty, and then also like creating a whole organization is pretty freaking cool, I guess I'll say. But I guess for me, I think one of the defining characteristics of our generation of teenagers definitely has to be social media. And I think touching on a couple of things you were talking about earlier about like friendship and loneliness and like competition and all this stuff where you now see everyone on social media and like you compare yourself to everyone. Can you talk a bit about how you think that either accentuates things or creates different issues for mental health? Right. And social media, as you mentioned, is a really, really big part of adolescent development, especially nowadays, because during um, adolescent development, there's a part of the brain that's um, about self-consciousness, and that actually tends to be developing quite a bit during this time. And so because of that, teenagers are like, um, they have a heightened sense of self-consciousness. Like before I was like 13, first and seventh grade, grade, I didn't really care what I wore. Like to school, I would wear like sometimes sweatpants or whatever. But then after that, I was like, this, but the clothes I'm wearing don't seem right. They just feel weird. Others might laugh at me, right? You always want to try to like act cooler, I guess, for some time because you don't want people to mock you all the time. And that happens quite a bit especially in the brick and mortar schools um, in the USA. I'm not sure, if I don't know if that's as much here in Stanford online because our school is so different, but in brick and mortar schools, um, that is definitely something that happens quite a bit. And so 100%. like, with this, yeah, and like with this heightened self-consciousness, um, I guess that makes people want to look good on social media as well. And so that's where it ties into social media, right? Because um, the studies I read that Teenagers have like around, it's like an average of 400 followers on Facebook. And now that's probably outdated because we all don't use Facebook anymore. But um, for, there's around 400 followers on Facebook. But like they have like maybe 20 friends who they can connect with, who they can like share their troubles with. Especially now when everything on social media, we want to seem perfect on social media, right? And unfortunately, like the way people are on social media isn't really how reality, how they actually are in reality. They want to connect more individually. They want, we still want people to um, share our thoughts with individually. But we don't want to like come off as weak in a way. And sometimes there's maybe only a couple of friends who you have who you can confide in about like the troubles you're going through. Um, and especially because teenagers, we just don't tend to trust our parents as much as we do trust some of our close friends. Um, we really only have a couple of people and maybe occasionally um, if there's some adult we trust to share our troubles in. And I guess with social media, you see some people who have this like perfect life and it's again a perfect life on social media but you don't know that what's actually going on in life but you see only their social media side right and you're like oh look at them why why can't i be like them and that does create um definitely a bit of trouble it leads to a negative mentality it, it preys upon the heightened self-consciousness during adolescence um that's not to say social media is only bad i mean as we mentioned there's dark side too, but there's also a positive side in that it has like a lot for connection um it allows people to reach out to one another to maybe for example, it makes it easier to find for teenagers suffering with mental health, or as I mentioned, the eating disorders, it makes it easier for them to find these institutions which might help them. But it also makes it easier, like maybe maybe you make a couple of friends with social media as well, and connections are always great um, to make as well. So there's definitely a positive aspect of social media, and there is a negative aspect which cannot be overlooked as well. Oh yeah, definitely. I really like that. I think that also opens the question, like you did make a lot of contrast between 
brick and mortar and online. And lucky us, we've got a brick and mortar student here with us in contrast to the three of us online. Um, I want to know your thoughts and then like see what Andrew has to say about that because he has the experience in brick and mortar and obviously we know what it's like being online. Um, You know, like how you mentioned, right, the perception of what our lives are like online because of what we decide to portray in comparison to in brick and mortar where you can't have that same wall. Uh, What do you see in the mental health issues for like, I guess, starting off with friendship and connections, because that's what you started off with too. How do you think that differs or impacts teenagers more so in that aspect in comparing the two environments? Because obviously, you might say that being online, we have this portrayal or this, I I don't want to say facade, because that sounds really bad. But like this wall against what you put up with friends, even though you, you know, you develop these friendships online in comparison how you do that brick and mortar uh Shivak, how you interpret that and then Andrew what do you have to say about that too sounds good so actually um I was in a brick and mortar school in freshman and sophomore year and I was only a single course student at OHS but in junior year I actually came full-time to stand for OHS so the stuff that happens in brick and mortar school is like really fresh in my memory um and so in brick and mortar schools and actually I did go to a small private school so it's probably not as typical of like the public school typical public school in the United States but from what I remember um in seventh and eighth grade especially there was like this huge focus on trying to be popular and cool like every single person wanted to be like in that little group which is like the popular group you know what I'm saying and so a lot of people um would and I guess that led to the rise of a lot of bullying in a way actually in seventh and eighth grade and I went to a small school and when everyone knew each other and there was still quite a bit of bullying that went on um Obviously, some people would say, oh, it's just a joke, but really it wasn't. Like, they would target certain people, like, for example, shorter kids who were, I guess, more hyperactive at the time. Um, They would tend to be, like, kind of shunned. And actually, I knew one of them who was my friend. He was also shunned in that way because he was, he was, a, he was a really good person. Like, he had, was a great person, but I guess he just wasn't, they didn't consider him to be as cool as them, right? And so that, that's definitely an issue in um uh, the brick and mortar school. And you're right, you can't really like hide an aspect of yourself in a brick and mortar school. There's something you're embarrassed about yourself. And in teenagers, like self conscious as I mentioned, self consciousness, they we do are a bit embarrassed of ourselves sometimes. There's nothing you can really hide um in school. I do think that through brick and mortar school I've made some of my closest friends who I still talk to even now. Um and I've I if I do have problems, I'm willing to spill it to them because I've known them for so long. We've we've been through like we I guess we played together in school, we talk together all the time. And there's like an inherent sense of trust, which I feel you can make in online schools, but it's a bit harder like in online schools that you're not able to physically talk and interact with individuals. And while we can still like talk through Zoom or through Skype, I mean, there's a difference, right? Like when you're in physically in person with somebody. And so I feel I feel there's positives and negatives to both as there always is, right? So in, in brick and mortar schools, there's a positive where you can make deep connections with people really easily or not really easily, but relatively easily. Um, but there's the con that there's to strive for popularity, you have to look cooler among everyone else. And um, compared to, at least compared to the OHS, there's much more bullying that goes on. And that's especially an issue that affects teenagers um, because I guess we're already prone to what our peers say. And then with bullying affecting someone, it may make them feel really, really depressed. And that has been known to cause quite a bit of suicide among teenagers. And so there's that aspect of brick and mortar schools. Now, in online schools, as I mentioned, um, it is a bit harder, obviously, to make deep social connections. Um, I've also found it harder to make a few friends at Stanford OHS. But um, what I do think is that from, like, in comparison to brick and mortar schools, I feel it can also sometimes be a less toxic environment in that, especially here at OHS, I've been really more focused on myself a bit um, in terms of, along with my initiative, spreading awareness, um, but also in, like, my studies, which I'll admit with um with peers they while they do remain a priority there's also a component of like always like hanging out with friends um seeing feeling how they think about you and so when I moved here to OHS I definitely felt a bit more relaxed and at peace um in that way um but I'll admit that I I I was in the beginning of last year especially there was a bit of loneliness because I didn't really have I wasn't seeing my friends on a daily basis and I was new to the school right so. I didn't really have too many people to talk to at first, but eventually the year went on, I made a couple of friends. And so in that case, I've actually enjoyed the online school better, but I, I won't say that it's like 
perfect, right? Because there's definitely a few drawbacks. And I'm interested to see what Andrew has to say, especially as he does go to freaking murder school. Yeah, I mean, A, first of all, this is so funny for me because I've never heard the term brick and mortar school before. This It's just school. Um, so fascinating. But no, so I think, I mean, I think, Shrek, you touched on this a lot. But like, honestly, like, the big determining factor in so much is just like physical positioning. Like a lot of my good friends are people who I've sat next to in class. And like, I think that's something where like on Zoom, like you don't, sit next to someone on class like I've taken my one online class this summer and like remote learning in the spring and like it's just you don't get to like I think the issue that I see is like at school you're sort of forced to interact with a lot of different people which swings both ways because obviously you get to meet new people you get to make new friends and like there are a lot of really good people out there but also then if there are people you don't like it's really hard to avoid them um then I think the other aspect with like physical positioning is like when you're in the common areas, when you're in the lunchroom, it's like, who do I, who do I sit with now? Who do I talk to? And like, you think it's nothing, but then there's, there's nothing official, obviously, but like there are distinct, we have like a big common area with different couches, like different friend groups. It's like blocked off, like clockwork. And then, like, not everyone can fit in. It's, like, who doesn't get to sit in the common area? So it's definitely, like, a big thing. And then, obviously, like, I think the big point that Shivak was talking about is, like, you really, like, every part of you is out there. Like, you get to know you. Like, for example, I remember, I Chloe or remember this, too. I was taking this online class this year, uh, this summer. And at the end, we were talking. And this kid was like, I'm going to fight you. You're probably like a 5'3 midget. Like, I would, I would beat you up. And I was oh, like, yeah. Jokes I remember that, yeah. I was like, joke's on you, actually. I'm really tall. I'm like a cool 6'3, not to, not to flex. But I was like, you don't know me at all. Because, like, that's a big defining part of my character at school. People are like, oh, there goes Lanky Andrew. So it's weird to think that, like, you all just are sort of forced to know each other through the online realm. It's true. I remember that. Yeah. Being in the online, getting to know Andrew first, right? Because I think uh, after talking to him, you kind of get the impression of like, he's got a really positive personality. And like, he kind of said this without us saying it. He was like, you think I'm short. Like, he, that, I think that was the fir- one of the first things that um, when meeting him and in our group, right, Andrew, you can like, you know, yeah. confirm. Totally. Um, yeah, no, because I think like the way yeah like you, what you look like like obviously this isn't the way like it should be but like that definitely plays a role in how people see you and like how they interpret your words and actions sophie hopkins been a while. sorry i was just saying it's really interesting that people thought you were short because not gonna lie being in this online environment i've tried so hard to guess people's heights but when i meet them in person i realize i completely failed with that so i i apologize in advance to everyone who I meet in person, I will probably think you're taller or shorter than you were. But I also think having that is really nice, not gonna lie, that sort of anonymity online, like not gonna lie, like before I attended online school, um, I didn't particularly go to brick and mortar myself, but I was doing more in-person classes. And just ha- not having to worry as much about how you look or how you appear and just like, okay, this is the only thing people see of you is nice. The amount of times I rolled up in pajamas is insane. But yeah, that's that has happened a lot. But again, I really think it's it's nice in online school not having to worry about that. Right, definitely. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you don't have to judge me that I'm not wearing pants. You don't know that, right? <laughs> <laughs> not that I'm wearing pants. Don't worry about it. Anyway, moving on from that conversation, um, we also wanted to talk a little bit about something that's really hot right now, you know, the the whole police brutality with um, Black Lives Matter and um, specifically discriminating against uh, African-American teens. And on the topic of, you know, mental health awareness of it's a lot traumatizing, especially and detrimental to the African-American teens right now in this adolescence period, like Shavek, you've mentioned how all of this 
going on right now can affect them a lot more, you would think, right, for their mental health, seeing all these really uh, graphic videos and content online and having this happen in person too, having to deal with that and, you know, deal with it is a lot, I would assume, right? Um, can you, I guess, elaborate a bit more from that perspective? Yeah, and so um, I've seen like on social media, especially a lot of African-American teenagers are talking about like how, I mean, how they've always never really felt safe in terms of like going out um, at certain places. Um, they know that like if there's a policeman after them, like in many cases, especially in social media, a lot of, a lot of African-American teenagers are like, I wouldn't know what to do. I just have no idea because because of the way they feel they're being targeted, especially, um, they just wouldn't know how to react in some cases. And honestly, with the situations that have been going on with Ahmed Arbery, George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, now Jacob Blake as well, it's, it's, you just can't blame them for feeling like that because it is definitely, um, with these situations being highlighted, it's definitely something they would feel like. And unfortunately, um, even like the leadership in our country hasn't done much to currently alleviate um, I guess the way they're feeling so far. Um, I do think that they are fortunate to have a few model, role models. For example, I'm a sports fan, and yesterday actually, and the day before, the NBA they took a huge stance um, against um, racial injustice by boycotting the games. And actually, it's still sad to see that quite a few individuals, instead of commending them, were talking about how it really wasn't useful what they were doing, or um, they were attacking the NBA players, and so. I feel like there's definitely a really, it's still really divisive, especially for these adolescents um, who are growing up. And I guess they really won't be able to fulfill the dream of like, the, as of now, especially for these adolescents. And because remember that memories and situations that happen in adolescents tend to go on for a long time because adolescence is such a critical period. That these are memories they'll remember like forever. They'll, it'll be hard for them to maybe even ever in the future um, feel safe or feel equal just because of they'll always remember these incidents in the teenagers during what happened um, at their protests, for example, like recently what happened in one of the protests in Kehosha, I think, in, um, in um, Wisconsin. And then again, what's happening with policemen, how a lot of people are actually justifying them too, which is something that is, in my opinion, absolutely insane. So I definitely understand that a lot of African-American individuals will be impacted by this. They'll, um, in the future, they'll be, these are events that they'll remember. And it'll definitely be traumatizing when next time maybe a police car does come after them, they may not know how to react. And then again, that would cause more problems, right? Because when you, a lot of the times it happens is because people are just not sure how to react. And so I think this is definitely going to have a really huge impact on all of us, but especially these African-American individuals in the future. Yeah. And can I just chime in? Because I'm also following the NBA very closely and especially in light of the protests. Right. I think one thing that stuck out to me on the mental health side is a lot of the players were speaking out of like we've been because they're in a bubble in Orlando for all of our non NBA followers like they've been now away from their family for a long time and away from their communities and having to witness all of this and I know a couple of the players including like one who was supposed to be like an all-star caliber player this is Paul George for all my basketball fans and was having a terrible run in the playoffs and he spoke out he was like my mental health has been like taking a hit. Like I was suffering from anxiety and depression while I was in the bubble. And like, that's why my play was bad. And I think it was just jarring for me at least to hear because like we see athletes and we think they're invincible. They're like almost, I don't want to say superior, but like you think they're like built different in a sense. Um, and it was just crazy for me to hear like, and remember like these are also like human beings who obviously are like suffering a lot and you think like if that's like the athletes who are like trained to like be able to concentrate you imagine them then like scaling it back down to teenagers like I can't even begin to imagine how you process or if you can right and like another thing especially when Paul George was speaking out people are actually like ridiculing what he was saying like oh he's come on he's like a millionaire he's got paid so much money his whole career is based off playing sports and I feel like people don't understand like even for teenagers um, if we talk about teenagers again, right? Like even people who tend to have a lot of money and wealthy, that doesn't mean they're necessarily better off in a way, or that that they don't they're um immune to mental health struggles because mental health and I guess um what goes on in your brain doesn't discriminate depending on your riches riches or wealth. It affects like everybody. Um, and it 
it won't just just because you have a lot of money doesn't mean you're going to be immune from a, um, a lot of conditions and so and we're seeing that like a lot even for example besides NBA players we've seen some like big celebrities and um, names also suffer from mental health conditions and they're famous people love them but that doesn't keep anyone immune and so it's definitely a really important conversation that we should be having right now nowadays and actually going back to the protesting as well a couple of players in the bubble they didn't want to be there anymore they wanted to go out and protest because actually from the Milwaukee Bucks a couple other players had actually been victims of police brutality before they had been stopped not it wasn't ever explicitly mentioned it was by the color of their skin but it was pretty much implied that it was because of the color of their skin and so this is something that affected these individuals like a long time ago when they were still in high school getting picked but it's something that still that still resonates with them. And so this kind of shows that these incidents that are happening during teenage years will leave these um, current teenagers, I guess, as you mentioned, a bit traumatized or a bit afraid in the future. That is definitely an issue that we need to consider. Yeah, definitely. Um, And that's definitely a conversation that we're going to continue in a future episode, but really grateful and really appreciative of the insight that you've been able to provide to us, Shivek, with, um, the brain side of things and gotta say feeling a lot more enlightened about my own brain as well after talking to you yeah um yeah don't worry about it sophie i think is wanting to add something too i have one more question actually um so honestly i'm very impressed with your journey in your research into this area and i'm so glad you've been spreading awareness about it so like throughout your process of researching and founding this organization like what is First, like your takeaway for yourself, but then also what is one thing that you want to let the entire audience know? Just like an encapsulating kind of sentence or two or whatever you want. Yeah, for sure. Um, And so I guess the biggest thing is not to undermine or undervalue like the role that development and adolescence has. And I guess the role that the way people interact with one another has on the development of us teenagers. Um, Because oftentimes, I guess, you could say, I guess, a rude thing to your friend in passing, or you could say, oh, those clothes don't look good on you, right? Or, like, just make fun of someone, someone's looks. And that you may think that's just a joke that you're making, but you don't know, I guess, how the person's feeling at the time. They may be feeling insecure, which is really common as well. Um, they may just not be feeling comfortable. And making these jokes in passing could be really, really hurtful to them and may cause them. I guess that's what causes, in many cases, like anorexia to develop as well. Like, people are saying, comment on, um, I guess their bodies as well and then when they do start to struggle with them, people are like oh you look great now and then they're like oh everything's going great maybe I should continue to start myself in a way and so I guess the biggest takeaway is to consider um, what the other person may be going through you you may if you don't know them I guess and what you're saying could be a really questionable statement be careful not to say that or maybe just consider or think about it for a second what you're saying um, and I guess for even for teenagers in general, um, the reading, understanding the developing brain, understanding like what you're going through will help you understand that you're not alone. Like there's all the teenagers in the world are going through a similar process of change and development that you are. Um, and really a lot of us will be able to understand, right? So if you are feeling something, don't keep it bottled up. Um, and you don't have to be like the perfect social media star either that maybe some of your friends are, are but what you should do is you find someone who you really trust um, a close friend, maybe a relative or a guardian who, who you know someone who's willing to listen to you and definitely talk to them because I found it helpful. A lot of, a couple of my close friends also found it helpful. It's like honestly just vent to each other a few times. I take the two things off your chest and it does make you feel a bit more relaxed. And so I guess that's my biggest takeaway is that um, don't try to bottle up feelings. Also be careful of what you're saying because while it may not be impacting you, it could be impacting someone near you, someone who you know. And we also want to avoid that as well. Yeah, thank you so much, Shavek. Um, so make sure everyone to go check out Shavek's site at ourteambrains.org and also check out his podcast, which is Our Teen Brains with Shavek on, I believe, Anchor as well, right? All right, sounds good. Really grateful for Shavek. Thank you for coming on. Thank you for citing such a great conversation with us on the teen brain, um, especially since we're all teens. I think we needed that too. Um, yeah. Otherwise, thank you guys for listening to Blurred Box. If you like our show and want to know more, please check us out on Anchor, Spotify, Google Podcasts, or please leave us a review on iTunes. 
and be sure to join us in two weeks for another episode of Blurred Box as we are going to be releasing every Sunday. And we would love to hear your feedback, suggestions, and questions, which you can email to us at blurredbox88 at gmail.com. There's Instagram or Twitter at Blurred Box for the latest updates. All right. Thank you guys for listening, and we'll see you in a bit. Bye. Bye, guys.